Okay, this is going to be the first video dealing with Module 6. There's a lot of material in Module 6. In order to estimate probabilities of something occurring, you have to repeat an experiment many, many times. Not 5 times, not 10 times, not 20 times, not even 100 times. You would probably have to do something thousands of times in order to get a realistic probability of what the outcome of something occurring is. So, for example, there are such things as um, pig dice. And yes, I myself bought it at Target. They're very little dice. They're very, very small dice in the shape of a pig. Now, there are different outcomes. For example, the pig can land on its right side or its left side or on its back and so on. The probability of each one occurring is not the same. It's not like a regular die where the probability of getting a 1 is a 6. The probability of getting a 2 is a 6. Now, the probabilities that you're seeing on the screen right here, those were formed by somebody tossing the pig die many, many, many times. And what we have is a probability distribution. A probability distribution consists of the possible outcomes, like what we have here, along with their associated probabilities. That is a probability distribution. Now, we say that each probability has a value between 0 and 1. This would be where we're not expressing it as a percent, but as a decimal. And we know that the sum of all the probabilities of all possible outcomes in this experiment has to be 1. 1 corresponds to 100%. Two events are independent. That is, one event does not influence the probability of the next event occurring. So, for example, when you toss a coin, let's say it comes up ahead. The next time you toss the coin, the probability of being ahead a second time is still one half or 50%. It doesn't matter that the first time it, it came up ahead. Now, suppose you were to toss a coin 10 times in a row, and let's say the 10 tosses resulted in 10 heads. Now. That is unlikely, but it is possible. Does that mean that if I was to toss the coin again on the 11th try, that the probability of being ahead has now gone down? No, not at all. The probability of being ahead coming up would still be one half. That is what we mean by independent. Now, the probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A times the probability of B. For independent events, you multiply the probabilities. So, for example, the probability of tossing a coin three times in a row and getting a head, a head, and a head, and a tail, I mean, head, head, tail. It's the multiplication of the three probabilities. A half times a half times a half, which is one-eighth. Okay, two events are mutually exclusive if they cannot occur at the same time. So, for example, the probability of you, t you tossing a die of getting a 4 or a 6 on just that one toss. Now, it's impossible. You can't get both a 4 and a 6 at the same time. You either get a 4 or a 6 or a 1, or a 2, or a 3, or a 5. But you can't have the 4 or the 6 occurring simultaneously, not with one toss. That's what we mean by mutually exclusive. So in that case, the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. So let's skip down here for a moment. We roll one die. The probability the die shows a 4 or a 6. Now, that's mutually exclusive. Okay, That is where we add the probabilities together. Okay, so here, because they're mutually uh, exclusive, we can add the probabilities. 1 6 is the probability of getting a 4, plus 1 6 is the probability of getting a 6. Add them together, you get 2 over 6, which is 1 third. Now, 
Suppose the two events are not mutually exclusive, where they share a possible common outcome. Now, if we just added the A and the B together, we would be double counting some values. So, in order to undo this, where the A and B are not mutually exclusive, we have to take away things we double counted. So that is why we subtract the probability of A and B. But we only do the subtraction if A and B are not mutually exclusive, where they have some overlap. Okay, let's look at this two-way table that you, would, you may have seen in Module 5. So here we have the region of the country, and we have the number of people that were polled that have no health insurance and some health insurance. Okay, find the probability that a randomly selected person lives in the South or has no health insurance. This probability can be written as the probability of living in the South or no health insurance. Now here, this is equal to the probability of living in the South. Now, living in the South, 113,137 out of the total number of people that responded to the survey, plus the probability of having no health insurance. Well, that's 49,835 out of 305,688. But notice there is some overlap here. Living in the South and having no health insurance. There are 21,639. So those 21,639 have been double counted. They've been included in this, the 113, 137, and they've been included in the 49,835. We have to undo the double count. So now we subtract the probability of A and B, the probability of living in the South and having no health insurance. So this is where they are not mutually exclusive, and that gives us 46.2%. Next, the mean of a discrete probability distribution. Now again, discrete means that the values can be like 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, something that you know what the next value is. Continuous would be like a height or a weight where you can have an infinite number of values. For example, somebody could weigh 172 pounds. Somebody could weigh 172.1 pounds. Somebody could weigh 172.01 pounds, and so on. There are an infinite number of possibilities there. Now, for discrete, where you know what the next value can be, you get the mean, now that's the Greek letter mu here, by summing up, this is the Greek letter sigma, that means sum, you sum up each x value times its probability. That is how you get the mean or the expected value or the average. Okay, so in this example for a car, we have annual maintenance and, annual maintenance and repair costs for years one through five and the probability of having to spend that amount of money. So what is the expected cost of routine maintenance and possible major repairs for the first five years? So what we're going to do here is the expected means the mean. So we're going to take each x value times its associated probability. 0 times 0.19 plus 500 times 0.67 plus 1000 times 0.09 plus 1,500 times 0.04, plus 2,000 times 0.01. Now, when you do this on your TI, make sure you put parentheses around each multiplication. So, for example, you would have left parentheses, 0 times 0.19, end parentheses, plus parentheses, 500 times 0.67, end parentheses, and so on. And when you do that, you should get a value of $505. All right, what we're going to start to look at next is we're going to now take the knowledge we've accumulated and we're going to transition 
into the things that are important for the second semester of Statway, which is the normal distribution. The normal distribution looks like a bell-shaped curve. Now over here, let's look at a histogram for the distribution of adult male heights. Now the mean height for, a, for an adult male is 69. Now notice here, we've constructed a histogram. Now, if we know the area of each of these rectangles, okay, remember what is area? It is probability. So the area of each rectangle is the probability of a man's height being between those values. So if we have a value right here of 68 to 70, if we want to know the probability a man's height is between 68 and 70 inches, we would simply get the area of that rectangle. Area equals probability. But suppose we want to get the probability of a man's height between 69 and 71 inches. We don't have a rectangle that covers that interval. So what we could try to do is we could try to form thinner and thinner rectangles so that we could account for more and more possible ranges. But even doing this, having more and more rectangles, it's not going to cover every possible interval. So what we need is, we need to have the number of rectangles become thinner and thinner and thinner, so that the number of rectangles is almost infinite. Now, in order to get probabilities or areas, we're going to use our TI. But the first thing is, we need to know what a z-score is. The z-score is the number of standard deviations that a data value is from the mean. Okay, so that's going to be very important. The z-score is the number of data values the number of standard deviations a data value is above the mean. And this is the formula. A z-score is x minus mu over sigma. Mu is the mean, sigma, now this is lowercase sigma. That's the standard deviation. So if we had a z-score of 3, then that means that the data value is 3 standard deviations above the mean. If we had a z-score of 1.5, that means the data value is one and a half standard deviations above the mean. If we had a z-score of zero, that means that the data value is equal to the mean. And finally, if we had a z-score of negative 2.5, that means the data value is two and a half standard deviations below the mean. So again, when the z-score is negative, the data value x is below the mean. When the z-score is positive, the data value x is above the mean. And when the z-score is zero, then the data value x is the mean. So, for example, let's look at the um, heights of men. Okay, now, the mean is 69, the standard deviation is 3. So, remember, the total area under a curve is 1 because the area represents probability. What is the total probability of all the outcomes occurring? 1. So now, suppose we want to find the z-score for a man's shoe size and, I mean, sorry. Yes, so suppose, we, suppose a man's height is 73 and a half inches and we want to get the z-score. So again, the formula is the data value 73 and a half minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Again, make sure you do that subtraction in parentheses on your TI. So that gives us a z-score of 1.5. That means the man's height is one and a half standard deviations above the mean. 